uh, in the audience to the second day of uh, the policing during pandemic workshop, where we will be sharing and discussing experience from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. The first session today will look into the wellness and mental health of the law enforcement officials and their families during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the second session of the day, we will be dwelling into the issue of gender-based violence, child protection and trafficking, and other human rights concerns during the COVID-19 pandemic. So without uh, much delay, we will start the session uh, three on wellness and mental health of the law enforcement officials and their families during a COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, police officers' roles and responsibilities during the pandemic has placed them in challenging and demanding situation that can significantly impact not only their mental well-being, but also possibly uh, their performance. So speakers today will discuss the challenges related to mental health and wellness faced by the law enforcement officials during COVID-19 health crisis and what policies and procedures were put in place to address um, uh, these issues for the police personnel and their families. The session will also look into the steps for improvement of, uh, of uh, the mental health services for the future health crisis. Um, uh, with that, uh, let me introduce our speakers of the day. Dr. Sudanshu Sarangi, is, is, uh, he is the police office, senior police officer in the eastern state of Odisha, India. And prior to this, he served as commissioner of police in the capital uh, city of Odisha and handled the... Um, and, and handled the police uh, response um, to COVID-19. He has received his PhD in psychology from University of Liverpool in the United Kingdom. And the second speaker uh, is also from India, uh, Jayanto uh, and Chaudhary. He is the Vice President of Operations with the Public Health Foundation of India. He holds 37 years with the Indian Police Services and has retired as the Director General of the National Security Guard. He is currently a member of Center for Security uh, Studies um, and Simulation with the United Service Institution of India. He is also a member of expert panel with the Department of Personal and Training and with the Bureau of uh, Police Research and Development with the Government of India. The next speaker uh, is uh, DIG uh, Shergil Karal, who is the Deputy Inspector General and currently serving the Hyderabad range in Sindh province in Pakistan. Previously, he has served in UN peacekeeping mission in Kosovo, UNMIC, and in Liberia, UNMIL. He has also written a handbook on forensic investigation and criminal investigation for officers of the Sindh province. Our next speaker is uh, ACP Ishmael Naveen. He's the head of Central Police Command and is leading security coordination of the capital of Maldives, City Police. Um, he is currently represents police at the National Emergency Center for Planning and Overseeing Lockdown and Curfews. He holds over 26 years of experience in law enforcement covering parliament, presidential elections, and special and marine uh, operations. Dr. Bibek Bandari is a medical doctor and Nepal uh, from Nepal and a Nepal police officer. He is heading the emergency department of the Nepal department and uh, currently serves the COVID. 19 help desks of the Nepal Police for National Contact Tracing Protocol, Dead Bodies Management Protocol, and Nepal Police Work Plan for COVID-19. He was also the team leader of, of air medical evacuation against COVID-19 from Wuhan to um, Nepal. Our final uh, speaker uh, is um, Grant uh, Edwards. Uh, Grant is recently retired from the Australian Federal uh, Police at the rank of commander. After 34 year long career, uh, he, her, his policing career includes posting to Timor-Leste as mission commander and advisor to the Secretary of State for Security in the Timorese government. And he was also um, advising, he was also advisor to Afghanistan as a mission commander and deputy head of the International Police Coordination Board. Since retiring, uh, Mr. Edward works with the ASPECT group in Sydney as head frontline service for better mental health uh, for, the, for the services. And um, 
that concludes our speakers. And after the speakers' presentations, we will have 30 minutes for Q and A from our participants. We encourage that uh, to put your comments and questions if you have any in the Q and A segment, segment at the bottom of your screen. So uh, without much delay, I will give the floor to Dr. Sarangi for, for his presentation. Dr. Sarangi. Thank you. Thank you, Pasana. Uh, just a little background about myself because I have seven minutes. But within that, I joined the police in 1990. So it's already 30 years. You join typically as an assistant superintendent of police. Then I became a superintendent of police. Then a deputy inspector general of police. Then an inspector general of police. And since the last five years, I have been uh, in the number two rank in the police. That is the additional director general of police. Next year, hopefully, I'll be promoted to the next rank. That is director general of police in which Mr. Chow Choudhury has retired. He's a very eminent officer. Um, I have seen several situations, particularly dealing with uh, left-wing extremism, but dealing with COVID was extremely, extremely stressful. Uh, the enemy was unknown. Uh, there was a lot of fear in society and people wanted police to do a miracle. Uh, the expectations were very high that somehow we can stop the infection. Uh, the initial days, uh, even doctors were not clear about treatment, uh, but somehow they, they expected that we will come down heavily, not allow people to move around and infection will not spread. So uh, there was an issue of uh, unreasonable expectation and a degree of accountability for which we were just not prepared. Uh, but what was most stressful for me was sending my men and women some 8,000 of them to harm's way, knowing very well that I'm exposing them to infection and uh, anything can happen to any of them. We were sending them, motivating them to go and work day in and day out in sun and rain. Uh, and they were uh, asked to check people, the movement of people from one place to another, which meant that they have to see a record. Uh, often it is a paper. You have to go near the person or if it is a digital record, then still better. But you have to go very close to the vehicle or the person. So you are actually getting exposed to thousands of people during the course of your, uh, let's say, four or five hours of work. You must have come in contact with a thousand people. Uh, the other problem was police department has people at different age groups. So I started in the month of April with a uh, diagnostic uh, you know, test of uh, people above 50 uh, to recognize comorbidities. And we found nearly 250 people who were highly vulnerable. So one of the things we decided to do was to take them away from frontline duty uh, and put them in uh, staff duty uh, where they would be handling documentation uh, and not be exposed to this kind of a crowd. So age profiling and profiling of in terms of health was a primary responsibility. It took, took me almost a month to understand the whole thing. Uh, I have uh, here four hospitals and five doctors. And they were obviously on the lead. A lot of uh, support came from the corporate sector. Once we requested, the corporate hospitals came forward. Uh, and these screenings were done very, very quickly. We move in special camps and we could identify people who were highly vulnerable. So putting uh, policemen of different age group and different health profiles together in a team is a big risk. Second challenge was many of them lived in barracks, uh, joint accommodation, where they shared toilets, they shared the mess. So if one gets infected, everyone gets infected. So we had to do a lot of activities to divide the barracks, uh, thin it out, so that if we get uh, one barrack gets affected, limit uh, the infection to 20 persons, not get the entire police force down. So much is the expectation. And yet if everyone is down and they can't come onto the road, then it would be a big problem. In fact, many of them post-infection suffered and yet came, came out on duty. That was the sense of duty that they, that they sowed. So that was another challenge. Uh, two, three things that we did, which were very helpful. First is we could send a message to our police force that you are looking after society 
and as a police leader i am looking up to you so i set up teams anyone who is getting infected his name was entered her name was entered in a list with phone number and we would personally speak to them to find out how they are doing through the entire infection and recovery process if they are admitted to a hospital we will speak to their doctors and we would keep track of what is happening the very fact that we made a phone call the commissioner of police spoke to someone and found out how are you doing i think was uh, very highly appreciated by the force and um, that is something that is more of a human touch uh, those who remain in home quarantine you know that's a big issue when you put somebody in home quarantine because he is no longer being seen by a doctor we ensured that we ended up with a package with a corporate hospital which was handling covid patients we could take uh, the patient in our own vehicle escorted by volunteers who were covid rec recovered patients to the hospital for a set of uh, uh, diagnostic tests particularly uh, an uh, an an routine x-ray to detect infection in the chest and lungs and a set of blood tests like blood crp to detect infection uh, inflammation and a d dimer test to detect any uh, any clotting that that might be taking place so we could intervene pretty quickly uh, so if you put someone in the home quarantine and for the seventh or eighth day he is not telling you anything you really don't know what is happening to him and by the time you decide to intervene it might be late so we decided on a protocol that on the third day we would intervene and we set it like a protocol a kind of a routine we set up machinery we put up teams and we could do that the other thing that helped me a lot was setting up my own test center because if you ask policemen to go to um go to a, a test center in a hospital they are reluctant they would try to avoid particularly persons with minor symptoms very low level of symptom let's say cold or slightly feverish we could since we had our test center we could do that i had uh, two test centers and with that we could handle uh, that so despite all these i had 1600 people who got infected and i lost eight people which was really bad but out of the eight people three or four were had such severe comorbidity that we could not have done much otherwise i felt the 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 kind of practice that we um, created the kind of system that we put in place the sop they had done very well in handling infection so this is something uh, that we need to document and we have we will share it with others how to go about uh, future pandemic and how to handle your police force you we need to look after our men and women they are sacrificing so much and it is our responsibility to look after them thank you so much well um, dr sarangi has i think uh, given a very clear picture of um, how at the field level police leaders actually dealt with the situation uh, now i um, i i'll give a slightly broader overview of uh, the covid uh, situation and the police how it affected mental health now in india policing is a highly stressful occupation i'm sure in many other countries it, it is also stressful but in india is particularly stressful you have prolonged working hours you're dealing with the underbelly of society you're managing conflicts in a nation in the midst of a million mutinies dr sarangi had referred to one um, you know we are facing a uh, they are facing conflict situations and then you have inadequate resources you are always fighting for budgets you you have a lot of extra legal pressures and you have a poor public image now in the states police you have even today a mass of constabulary about 80% uh, unfortunately this is the legacy and um, very often they are poorly trained and in several states they don't have sufficient hygiene facilities like accommodation vehicles and so on so working 10 to 15 hours a day is normal 
weekends off and vacations are are infrequent very rarely uh, do they uh, you know are, the, are these possible most states in india have half and less police strength recommended if you look at the global benchmarks of 220 civil police per 100000 population so there is little scope for what we today we call work life balance or shift systems days off these are taken as givens in most other professions but not in most of the states in india moreover there's a very rigid hierarchical system even today that worsens uh, the self esteem of uh, subordinate police personnel there have been several surveys surveys that reflect that most subordinate police personnel in india feel stress and tension because of their jobs about a year and a half ago the public health foundation of india with which i am now associated along with the indian police foundation and the bureau of police research and development uh, conducted a workshop on occupational stress and mental health issues among uniformed personnel the papers and discussions presented at this workshop by not just uh, police leaders by medical officers who work with in, the, in i mean uh, with police units all these validated these surveys and they have affirmed that mental health issues such as burnout psychological distress sleep disturbances depression substance abuse ptsd suicides and behavioral issues such as anger management management that are prevalent amongst field police personnel were in fact triggered by job stress and needed urgent remedial measures now let's come to the mental health impact of covid-19 on police personnel in india now the police were among the first responders to the covid-19 pandemic and along with health care personnel are frontline corona warriors the pandemic required many police personnel to assume responsibilities that were not part of their regular work profile the primary responsibility to implement the lockdown to restricting public movement and ensuring physical distancing was by the police in addition to monitoring check posts 24/7 monitoring hot spots ensuring lockdown as well as containment zones police carried out a variety of non traditional roles these include this still in, um, is, this is ongoing so these include creating social awareness clarifying fake news this rumor spread as fast as the epidemic sometimes daily inspection of people in isolation or quarantine assisting the health department in contact tracing helping migrant workers to find shelter and food and helping others in need in fact there have been police personnel who have given blood and those who recovered from covid at that time they donated plasma very freely so this was certainly above and beyond the call or the call of the regular role as dr sarangi pointed out this increased their vulnerability to covid-19 compared to the general population dr sarangi mentioned the risk, risk mitigation plans that he had and most other police departments of not employ, not deploying vulnerable age groups in the field arranging ppe from uh, Uh, sponsors um uh, sponsors when budget when government uh, approvals were still await, awaited and greater in use of technology to reduce physical contact early study studies have established the demanding working conditions i, I mentioned them and role ambiguity are a source of occupational other source of occupational stress among police personnel in india on the pandemic concern about being infected concerns about carrying the infection to family members became additional sources of psychological distress also fear of quarantine inability to access adequate 
medical services co compounded these fears. In the initial stages, lack of awareness of COVID-19 prevention and inadequate supplies of protective e equipment amplified these fears. And these concerns are not un un unfounded. Sample studies have indicated that the infection rate in the police force deployed on COVID duty were many times higher than the, in the general population. I mentioned yesterday that over 200,000 police personnel in India have tested positive and about 1,200 have died. This is more than twice the average number of police personnel who die in India in the line of duty each year. Some surveys have been carried out that reflect that 50% of respondents had mental disturbances due to fear of the COVID-19 virus. There have been some incidents of suicide associated with fear of infection or after actual infection. In addition to increased workload and exposure to infection with coronavirus, police personnel faced aggressive assaults by the public who resented restrictions. Hundreds of policemen have been injured. This is aggravated psychological stress. Several steps Several states have taken steps to control infection and enable access to timely and affordable treatment. Some, as uh, Dr. Saranagi mentioned, have set up telephone helplines for medical consultation. Insurance coverage in case of death in the line of COVID duty has been a great morale booster. Several states have instituted decorations for police personnel engaged in COVID duties as a uniform service uh, that is that is a motivating factor. In most states, senior officers were actively engaged and seen on the streets during this during these COVID duties. Many officers at the highest level also got the infection. This helped in building up a feeling that everyone, all ranks, were involved in the effort. Also, policing in India is usually top down. In the case of enforcing COVID restrictions, often the junior most constable on the street made on the spot decisions. Now a lack of training may have affected the quality and consistency of these decisions, but it possibly elevated self image, especially when the community hailed police personnel for compassionate actions. Now, these are just some of the thoughts that we had a lot, a lot more uh, studies will have to be carried out. Um, but I think, as I mentioned, you know, the heavy stress that Indian police face in some, some case, some way it was about battle inoculation. They just got on with the job and I'm so proud to belong to this police force where they just did what they were, what they needed to do without question. Thank you. That's it, Tupasna. Thank you so much, um, Jayanta Chori and uh, Dr. Sarangi for giving um, sharing the uh, experience of uh, Indian police. Um, now I will uh, request uh, DIG Karal uh, from um, uh, Police of Pakistan to give his presentation. Thank you, DIG. Good morning and uh, thank you very much. Can you go to the previous slide? Today's first slide. It's good morning and thank you very much, uh, uh, everyone. And uh, very welcome to Grant, uh, because I think uh, I see him as a new face today uh, on this forum. Um, we are actually carrying on from yesterday. And today's topic, uh, again, is very important. Uh, this session on wellness and mental health of law enforcement officials and their families during pandemic. Um, as very well put by uh, Mr. Chaudhary and Dr. Uh, Sudhanshu, we uh, were no different than India or what uh, all the experience faced by the Indian police. As we share quite a lot of similarities uh, in culture and uh, in, in, in different uh, aspects of our work life, our families, and more importantly, the way our uh, policemen operate, uh, the societies are quite similar, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll touch a little uh, different, uh, I'll touch on a little different uh, areas, uh, 
because theirs was more uh, conceptual and more uh, overall uh, broader areas that they touched upon. We uh, here, and of course, I'm sure it, it has also happened in other jurisdictions as well, uh, but we here did focus a lot on this area. How far was it enough? How far was it uh, enough or not? That's a, that's a separate debate. But uh, the, the command uh, in this region particularly and also all over Pakistan was quite sensitive uh, to this particular aspect as to how we can keep our uh, policemen, officers and their families safe during this pandemic. A uh, lot of thrust initially was given and still even to this day, we continue giving a lot of thrust on the fact that they have to keep uh, themselves safe by maintaining social distancing, carrying out their duties uh, very, very carefully. But there were certain ar other arrangements by the department as uh, encouraging factors given to them so that they would feel that uh, the department was not coming down heavy on them uh, to carry out their duties in this uh, pandemic crisis. Certain, certain positive areas uh, where uh, on point number four, we can clearly see that we were very flexible with leaves uh, and maintaining rosters of attendance. Uh, initially, straight away, uh, we gave uh, an order uh, all across the country that we could give 50% of, of the force time off uh, from the jobs, from the normal duties to take care of themselves and their families. It was quite a challenge because uh, we were also asked to enforce lockdown and if we temporarily lay off such a high number of uh, force, it, would have, it was quite a challenge to carry out the government directors and at the same time maintaining that kind of uh, attendance level. It's, uh, we uh, laid a lot of emphasis on police safety, uh, and protection. Uh, special directors were given out, were uh, issued, uh, where we made sure that each and every single police station or a police office in the country uh, was provided sanitizers. Most of uh, the buildings were uh, sprayed accordingly with disinfectants and uh, so on and so forth. However, the shortfall uh, regards to PPE equipment was uh, clearly felt uh, where we could not uh, make arrangements uh, on a uh, central go government basis to provide uh, the required number of PPE equipment. And here again, as I mentioned yesterday, private sector uh, kicked in and they gave us full support uh, under proper social responsibility heads and and other uh, sub, other depart, uh, units supported us on, on those lines. Training on safety measures uh, again was missing uh, 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 as as a formal procedure, as a formal uh, as formal briefing. But we made uh, we did make uh, ad hoc arrangements during roll calls and uh, special arrangements to invite uh, practitioners, doctors to brief our uh, police officers before they were going out on duties and how they would come into contact with public during uh, the, their normal duties, particularly when enforcing lockdowns or transporting detainees to the courts or to the prisons. Medical care was there, uh, but mostly in private hospitals. And private hospitals were overstretched. So we just thought that this was an opportunity. And in this region alone, we developed or and upgraded two of our own police hospitals where we could support and admit our policemen for initial treatment once they were tested COVID positive. Sadly, there were hardly any briefings on uh, occupational stress management and mental health. Uh, most of the briefings uh, were geared towards uh, 
keeping themselves sanitized, wearing gloves, masks, uh, and maintaining social distances. Most of the guidelines that we followed, as I see in the subsequent slides. Now here's this, uh, I'll go on the guideline in a bit. Here's this, uh, some police personnel which were affected uh, in, in my region alone. So we had uh, 10 different police officers, nine uh, dis districts and uh, one uh, unit would be my office. And out of, uh, and this was the first and the second wave. So out of a force of 18,000, 9,118 9, policemen were tested positive, which uh, comes to about 50%. Uh, were tested, sorry, that comes to about 50%. And out of uh, those 50%, 7% were tested positive. We had quite an elaborate arrangement uh, where we uh, made sure that all those uh, infected or all those, where well, all those who were tested positive were given uh, a nominal amount to support their families during that 14 days or 21 days of quarantine period, uh, however long it was. So 83% of those uh, positive tested policemen got their grants. Uh, grant was little over 5 million rupees, uh, which is our, uh, you know, uh, uh, local currency arrangement. So the realization was that they needed to be supported financially. On uh, the arrangements where we were able to, we were supposed to provide them face masks, PPEs, gloves, that is gloves and other gloves. Uh, we, uh, this is again my region. So overall, Sin police uh, had uh, higher numbers and Pakistan also had far higher numbers because there were four Five, seven, seven, uh, five regions in total. So 81,400 face masks were provided, 900 PPEs were provided, and then accordingly gloves uh, were provided uh, for the policemen to keep themselves safe. And not only the provision was made, but also we made sure that they used them and they know how, and, and they, we made sure that they were trained how to, to wear them and use them. Um, we had 24 deaths in total. So initially last year, as I, I'd say, 6,366 6, policemen uh, were uh, found infected. We were very fortunate that 90% of so recovered and only 24 casualties were recorded. And this, uh, is, this is a figure which is updated and uh, until last week. We have a package for the death compensation and we made sure that the amount was dispersed uh, timely so that they had uh, uh, you know, ample time and quite adequately make their uh, posthumous arrangements. And now we are into the vaccination phase where we're making sure that all uh, government arrangements of uh, have, of having our policemen vaccinated and, uh, and their respective uh, age group are ensured to, to have been vaccinated. So we're, we're, looking into, we're looking into their needs and we're looking into the, in, into the requirements. Uh, so those, these, are, uh, these are a few uh, areas that I wanted to touch upon uh, with numbers. Um, we were very fortunate uh, that in South Asia, we are one of the I think one of the countries where uh, this uh, pandemic has not hit hard. I, I don't want to make a tall claim uh, because anything can happen in the in the forthcoming months. But uh, but having said that, until now, my experience uh, of having served, especially in this region over the last uh, year or so, uh, is that we've been quite uh, we've been quite safe uh, with regards to facing uh, the rigors of this pandemic. A couple of guidelines towards the end I'd mentioned, and uh, they were issued by UNODC. And uh, thanks, uh, Upasana, you sent them to me. I also approached them here.
these have been translated into Urdu and have been circulated uh, across all and sundry uh, for the Sindh police. We continue to we continue to sensitize our officers. We continue to keep uh, the same uh, roster as to we give time off to officers who are facing uh, problems in their families with regard to uh, testing positive for COVID. Any of their family members, we are very flexible with their with their leaves, and uh, and naturally we are very uh, very very sensitized about it. Uh, one thing I must say towards the end that uh, when it first started out, uh, the level of sensitization was far higher than now, and, uh, and that naturally and generally does happen. Uh, protocols are put into place when we are first up confronting the challenge, and then uh, I shouldn't say that they they lose their importance, but uh, they they do lose their bite uh, in in the sense that people tend to become casual about it. But as senior commanders, it's it's our job to always make sure that they are helped, supported, and their financial assistance is given to them timely, and their cases are processed uh, properly and expeditiously. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, DIJ Kharal. Um, that was a very comprehensive uh, presentation, and also not only looking into what good has been done, but also what the challenges, the gaps still are lacking behind, which uh, um, the uh, Pakistan police is looking into. And um, hopefully we'll carry this on to our discussion uh, segment as well. Now, um, can I invite um, ACP Ishmael Naveen from uh, Maldives Police uh, Services? ACP Naveen. SP Naveen, uh, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, uh, once again. Uh, it was very informative uh, yesterday also during the sessions, and I think uh, I learned. I even learned a lot of uh, you know uh, knowledge and experience that you have shared uh, in yesterday's sessions. Well, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, you know the challenges that we had uh, during the pandemic uh, with regard to officers uh, mental health and uh, their families uh, well-being and things and which was done uh, by us and also through the government uh, government and agencies other agencies help next slide please <clears throat> well uh, the, uh, we had a lot of challenges uh, uh, with regard to the pandemic in law enforcement and even uh, looking after the families of uh, most of the officers uh, who are from uh, other parts of the country uh, with regard to the pandemic, most of the officers working in the front line, they were brought uh, into uh, you know, uh, hotels, they were housed in hotels being accommodated in uh, you know, small, small clusters uh, with their duty patterns in such a way that they don't get infected when one is infected. So we had to distribute uh, our strength, our forces into different hotels so that they don't intermingle and they have their own uh, medical bubble within themselves just to prevent uh, most of the you know, outbreak within the police ranks and police uh, frontline officers. And uh, most of them, were given, uh, as uh, I mentioned, uh, were, most of them were using social media on their phones and uh, most of them needed uh, phone, uh, the phones. So what we did was we uh, actually consulted with the government and with the help of the government, we contacted uh, uh, the telecom companies and we were given by the telecom companies some free extra uh, you know, social media time for them to contact uh, and have video chats and things like that, so that uh, officers working with uh, in the front line can give their time, uh, you know, without thinking of their families, so that they can uh, get give us maximum uh, on uh, on the front line. And uh, 
wellness of officers uh, there was uh, a police unit which was uh, you know rent uh, ad hocly made uh, when the situation arised uh, due to the pandemic to uh, look into wellness and uh, counseling of all the officers and if not needed uh, for the officers families in such a way that they had to attend uh, daily you know uh, things and the other things that we attended was their you know uh, families in such a way that uh, rations meaning uh, you know basic commodities uh, which the, uh, they needed most of the officers lived in small family units uh, and which uh, they had to attend uh, this was taken uh, this was taken care of by the police uh, welfare uh, association and uh, it was done in such a way that anyone who needed anything um, could buy and get it delivered uh, to their families on a daily basis and uh, that was something that needed uh, attention and uh, which needed uh, most of their time after after hours on the uh, on the front line so this was attended in such a way that uh, officers did not need to uh, you know think of uh, shopping daily shopping or weekly shopping for their officers uh, uh, next slide please uh the officer safety measures taken include uh, internal pandemic management unit which was established with uh, the police medical unit was attached to that and uh, doctors nurses and even uh, some of the volunteers uh, from our civil uh, service joined that to attend calls and hotline uh, which was established within the pandemic management unit so that daily routines can be set for them uh, who were quarantined especially uh, and daily there was uh, you know uh, feedback from them uh, so that they can uh, tell the counselors or people who call them or peers who they look forward to uh, on a daily basis engaged on a daily basis can talk to them when were in, they were in quarantine isolation or quarantine they were given given a routine exercise or meditation uh, uh, timings when they were in quarantine because most of the time they broke down um, most of the officers who were in quarantine or in isolation self isolation were uh, undergoing some mental uh, uh, or psychological issues uh, sops protocols were made then and there to ad address these issues within the police uh, rank and file so that it can be attended in such a way that we all had a say in that and uh, in spite of uh, in spite while we were doing this uh, the government came up with the idea of uh, giving a frontline allowance on on uh, the time that they have spent on the frontline uh, health officials get the most chunk of it uh, but police officers being on the front line get uh, also a chunk of it uh, in such a way that it gets it it gets deposited to their account on a on a monthly basis from the start of uh, the pandemic response for no. police uh, excuse me no. the police response uh, the police response to this was uh, uh, you know looked into by a lot of uh, uh, ngos and uh, red crescent and some other uh, ngos even helped in managing the uh, calls which were taken by the police operations uh, we had a special operation center for pandemic management unit where all calls regarding to psychological or mental health was given uh there was another app by another application mobile application by uh, the health protection agency which uh, was launched in two languages um, which could be uh, on a daily basis which could be self assessed and given a feedback those who are on high risk and those who cannot uh, are not very friendly with uh, mobile applications they were uh, called on a daily basis so that their mental health being and well being was looked after and monitored on a daily basis next slide uh when we looked at uh, look at the officer safety measures uh, taken include uh, 
vaccination for police officers and their immediate families. This was also done in such a way that um, wellness and mental health of the officials and even the worries of the immediate families were taken care of. And after current, uh, the quarantine period of self-isolation in case that they come into contact with uh, uh, positive, special seven days leave for officers uh, were given for officers who get positive. Uh, when we look at the statistics, uh, the first dose, yesterday even I mentioned this um, um, police being on the front line on a daily basis, 24-7, uh, we were given the first dose uh, with the front line and the risk, uh, high risk category. And uh, we have completed 92% of uh, our first dose for all police officers. And the second dose, which started last week, 10% uh, has been uh, given the second dose and it's ongoing. And when we look at the total police officers uh, who got positive, till yesterday it was 419. Um, still, uh, we are lucky that there's no death being a very young police force. Uh, we have not uh, come across any deaths. But there are people, there are officers who are on the high risk category who were, who were uh, given special leave so that they can stay indoors and not come out for frontline operations, operational tasks. Next slide, please. Uh, when we look at uh, police officers, we had to undergo multitasking at all levels. Uh, you know, when when we look at uh, special duties in quarantine centers, we had to undergo how to wear a PPE and how to get off a PPE. Donning and doffing was given. Uh, the training for donning and do doffing was given by to all police officers in case that they had to do it uh, on uh, on short notice or when they were called on short notice to such a duty. Special isolation facilities for police officers, uh, officers were established. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, hotels, guest houses were taken uh, and uh, stations, uh, they, uh, they were given uh, rooms based on their duty pattern so that they are in the same bubble uh, which not uh, cross infect other officers who are on duties. Uh, special arrangements were made to ensure the accessibility to psychological support. Uh, it, they were just a phone call away and they were being looked after. Uh, they will be called, up, called on uh, if they don't call up and uh, it was on a daily basis, everything was uh, in, a, in a routine basis as well. Government initiated uh, the high risk elements, uh, which was given to all frontline officers, which had categories. Uh, those who were in uh, uh, cleaning or those, those who were involved in frontline uh, engaging with the public, they were given a higher elements than people who were in the control room or in the operation centers. Training and awareness sessions were, ho were held to all frontline officers as well as uh, those who were on, uh, on uh, operation centers and administrative duties and civil staff members. We uh, actually were lucky that we got all uh, protective equipment uh, required from uh, uh, goggles, PPE, N95 uh, masks, and even uh, medical masks, and uh, even uh, the public donated uh, thousands and thousands of uh, cloth masks which were stocked and which, uh, which were used uh, by the police officers from across uh, Maldives. And uh, when we look at uh, some of the police officers did uh, a lot of sessions. When you look at uh, the right hand picture, that's police officers giving instructions or guidance on how to wear a PPE to other police officers who are trained by health officials and health officials being a lot uh, engaged in their duties. We were tasked on doing, doing this, uh, you know, of uh, informing other police officers or, you know, uh, getting officers how to wear PPE and self-protective equipment. So we, we, we actually were lucky in that uh, sense that we got uh, what we needed uh, uh, for safety of our officers. Yeah. That's that's all. If you have any questions, uh, I'm ready to answer in the question and answer sessions. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, ACP Ishmael. I mean, it was really a comprehensive uh, and uh, presentation from the Maldives. Now, uh, can I invite Dr. Bibek uh, Rajbandari from uh, the Nepal? Uh, yes, everyone. Go ahead, Dr. Yeah, sure. Have the screen been shared? Oh. oh we can see you. Uh, yeah. Now this presentation is coming up. Yeah, now stay everyone. I'm Dr. Vivek Rasmandari from Nepal Police. And currently I've been working as an emergency physician in, in Nepal Police Hospital. I'm an independent researcher as well. So today I'll be talking about the wellness and mental health in Nepal Police during COVID-19 pandemic. Before going to the topic directly, uh, to the topic directly, I would like to uh, focus on uh, the contributory role of Nepal police during COVID-19 pandemic. The first was started from air medical evacuation of 175 Nepalese citizens from Wuhan to Nepal. Here, the leading role was done by Nepal police as an evacuation team leader and the historical event was set. Here we have documented this procedure in detail and uh, published it in a uh, journal, Medical Journal of Nepal. The uh, link is shown below. Also, the second was first quarantine center setup where the Nepal police uh, had done a contributory role. Also, with the help of the Nepal army, we have uh, developed a protocol quarantine protocol and guideline of national level. The major role was also played in the formation of national special transport team and the implementation as well. And in the setting of medical uh, area, we were serving as a level two COVID-19 hospital to the Nepal police as well as the general public. Also, in the case of testing, contact tracing, telemedicine, quarantine, isolation, and ICU, and ventilator were also been served to the general population as well. We have also formed a, lo a local version of contact tracing as per the CDC and WHO, which were really easy for implementation for junior officer. And the significant role was also played in uh, the infection prevention control training, uh, formation of a booklet with the help of the Corona Crisis Management Center, which was Nepal Army and the government itself. We did this training all over the Nepal in most COVID-19 dedicated hospital in all the seven provinces of the Nepal. We are also involved in the development of a dead body management where uh, later, the government gave this responsibility to Nepal Army, and then we hand over those things. But uh, we played a major role in the medical legal cases of uh, dead body, which was related to COVID-19. So as we were involved as a frontline officer, uh, we were the uh, prone population in comparison with that of a general population. Because of our job nature, and not living in a close proximity with the family members, and also because of working in the low resource setting, and the active mandatory frontline uh, front workers during lockdown. So uh, taking this in mind, we decided to estimate the prevalence of uh, stress in Nepal police officers. After a rigorous approval from different uh, authorities, on 3rd of July, 2020, we took the approval from the Nepal Health Research Council as well. And then we started collecting data. We included 1,526 police officers and used COVID stress scale, which contains six domains. Each domain contains six questions, which make all together of 36 questions. And we put it in a Likert scale. These questionnaires were developed from the Canadian psychiatrist which we re, uh, translated it to Nepali and validate it with a pilot study 
and then we ask these questions to our frontline workers. Will we include the uh, fear of catching the virus by the frontline workers, as well as, well as to the family members, and the uh, capacity of our healthcare system will also be asked, and so on. And while analyzing the data, we came to find out that the high prevalence was, highest prevalence was of the domain xenophobia, which means the foreign fear of foreign, foreign things, where in this case, the foreign thing was the virus. And followed by the contamination and the compulsive checking behavior. All these prevalent uh, groups of stress were between 18 to 27 A's and in male and those who were living alone beside in comparison with that of the married one. Uh, in this background, the estimate, while estimating the prevalence of stress, it was really high. So we uh, took these kind of steps to enhance the mental health of our uh, police officers. We made the booklets, we make pamphlets, we make audio visuals, and we uh, just made it available easily in our websites. We conducted a stress management classes and trainings like breathing exercise, yogas, and other exercise as well. We established the telemedicine service where the screening, monitoring, and counseling was done. Also, we did a dedicated health, health help, helpline for the COVID-19 problems. These are the glimpse of yoga and de-stressing activity, which was done for the mild and moderate case of COVID-19, we're staying in the isolation center. Also, we uh, formulate in a local language, the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 related stress, which the uh, frontline worker themselves came to know whether they have been the early sign of uh, COVID-19 stress or not. So they could seek the medical attention uh, in early, early stages, so we can treat them in early stages as well. Yes, there were too many challenges for us, but we overcame it somehow. The first challenges was lack of uh, PPE and lack of adequate PCR testing in early stages of pandemic, a proper and adequate space of quarantine like in training centers and other stations, uh, the limit, uh, limited amount of a transport, uh, transportation system, like we were engaged in the patient transport team, but the proper transport uh, system was really low. As we were uh, living in a joint uh, manner, in a cohort manner, in a barrack, that was also a uh, difficult scenario to maintain the social distancing. And the next thing was the recruitment problems in case of the pandemic as we were getting a uh, lack of human resource. All those leading to the fear, and this fear was the main cause of the mental stress in Nepal police, in, in other police agencies as well. So to overcome this fear, uh, we just analyzed the demographic population of Nepal police. And combining that with that of the natural history of COVID-19, we came to find out that the COVID-19, as we all know, is severe in the age more than 55 and with other comorbidities like heart disease and diabetes and hypertension. So we just uh, analyze the population of uh, demographic population of the Nepalese, popul uh, Nepalese uh, police personals. So uh, we came to find out that the number of the uh, police personals were more than 55 was, were just nine. And with comorbidity were also really low. That means we uh, reassure them by telling like, if uh, we, may, we may encounter the COVID-19 someday in our uh, duties, but if that happens also, the COVID-19 severity will be really low. It will be just uh, between mild to moderate. And with this kind of uh, information, evidence-based information with by literature review, rigorous literature review and all, they were assured. And also, those police officers who have already did some com comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, they were last in the line to serve the, pub the public. We also made innovative ideas like uh, the local solution uh, for uh, maintaining the law and orders and also the social distancing by using this kind of device. 
Also, uh, to overcome the lack of human resource, we use dummies in a traffic dress carrying the notice where overcome the lack of human resource. Also, by using the uh, technologies like drones, we maintain the lo lockdown uh, law, law and others. Regarding the recommendations, which, which we all did was uh, during this pandemic, which we all did was the public health work. Majority of the work we did was public health kind of work. So uh, if there had been a public health expert incorporated inside the police the, uh, institution itself, then the communication gap, the time lag, the proper management of risk communication would be there with sustainable human and material resource, which would lead to less mental stress. So I would like to stress on the incorporation of public health department inside the law enforcement institution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bibek Bandari, for your presentation. Um, it was quite um, extensive and comprehensive, and I'm sure there will be question, uh, there will be question and answers session. There will be some reflections on on the presentation uh, as well. Now we reach to our final uh, speaker, uh, Grant Edwards. Please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Bhushana, uh, very much. I'll just. Uh... Just get the presentation ready. Well, try again. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you once again. The um, the convergence of law enforcement and public health uh, continues to increase, uh, and COVID is a perfect example of that. the uh, The concept of wellness in uh, police workplace is relatively new. Uh, with many organisations actively pursuing programs to improve the lives of their staff. Uh, it is well known that police suffer higher prevalences of stress-related illnesses than the general public due to the hazardous and stressful nature of the occupation. More than ever, police are succumbing to the accumulated stress of regular exposure of the occupation. Combined with stresses in their organisations and their private lives, these sources of tension increase several risks in terms of their psychological and physical health, their family relationship, physical injuries, emotional trauma and ambiguity and negativity about their roles and functions in society. COVID-19 has amplified these stresses, not only for the police, but their family and their loved ones too. Around the world, the role of security sector is in the spotlight for enforcing policy and governance intended to halt the spread of COVID-19. The security sector is an essential part of an effective and comprehensive pandemic response and plays an important role in supporting public compliance with restriction, restrictions. Geostrategically, uh, the rapidly changing pandemic is redefining the international landscape as we know it today. Public health practitioners are at the forefront of the response measures, as we know, but security and justice actors are in the middle of managing a challenge that has the potential to alter socio-cultural dynamics, severely impair the economy, reassess international relations and redefine political values and the role of the state and civil society. Oops, sorry, go back again. Sorry about that. The COVID-19 pandemic has created social upheaval and altered norms of members of society, but its effect on police have been particularly profound. The police community is not immune uh, to the spread of this illness. And we heard that from um, Mr. Chowdhury earlier. In fact, due to the nature of police work, specifically the need for officers to violate the national guidelines on social distancing and to carry out their critical functions, members of the law enforcement are likely to be at higher risk of exposure than many others in the public. And as a small uh, South Asian example, uh, this relates to the, uh, to the personnel in India. And it shows that uh, all, they're almost nine times more likely uh, to get affected by COVID-19 compared to the general population. And we saw the statistics earlier in terms of um, the positive, et cetera, due to the unconventional duties that they were 
required to do. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find any uh, any material for other parts of South Asia. That just gives a little bit of a um, an idea of uh, contextualizing what we're talking about today. But we had been here before, and the reason I talk about this is that uh, back in the 80s, uh, one of the closest comparisons to the current police dilemma with COVID-19 was the spread of HIV in the 80s, and, and probably many uh, present today would remember that. While HIV is manageable today, at the time, uncertainty reigned. Law enforcement officers were tasked with enforcing policies in an environment of misunderstood risk. There was a pervasive fear of HIV among officers who generally underestimated the occupational risk. The perceived inability to manage HIV risk intensified fear. The officers of that era had limited and evolving information about transmission and the potential impact on their families, much like those policing during the height of COVID-19 today. And we've seen that with some of the, uh, the demonstrations and the people that wish to uh, not adhere to the rules with, uh, with spitting at police officers or throwing urine or fecal matter in an attempt to, uh, to try and infect or, or at least have the police officer believe that they've been infected. In terms of mental health stresses, and I'll just state up front here that um, I actually have a lived experience uh, with being diagnosed uh, uh, with complex post-traumatic stress, high functioning depression and anxiety as a result of my, uh, my time in the police. But what I wanna stress here is, is that I was able to um, seek treatment to, um, to uh, get myself uh, better. And I was able to uh, eventually be a productive member uh, of the police force. And that's the essence of what I'm saying, uh, what I'm talking about today because we're all going to suffer it at one time um, or another. As we know, police is one of the most mentally taxing occupations and it, uh, it increases the risk of psychological work-related injuries. Police officers are exposed to unique sets of challenges in their day-to-day -day duties and can increase the risk for mental health concerns. Occupational burnout and exhaustion result in reduced motivation uh, in care or passion for the work. For others, it can cause feelings of helplessness or powerlessness, resulting in emotional disengagement. Depression substance uh, misuse as a coping mechanism and occupational stress injuries, which are persistent psychological difficulties resulting from operational service related duties are also common. Uh, to contextualize, according to uh, a 2018 Lancet Commission uh, document, mental disorders are on the rise globally. Uh, and, and will cost the global economy approximately $16 trillion US dollars by 2030. That's only nine years away, with an estimated 12 billion working days lost every year. And these statistics were gathered well before COVID came into place. So we could probably amplify those statistics. The point there is, is that police, given the high propensity to suffer mental health injuries, those statistics will only increase in terms of the cost and the estimated loss of productivity to policing agencies around the world for officers that are suffering a mental health injury. Overlay the COVID-19 pandemic, and this presents not only an extra element of risk for the police in terms of exposure to the virus, but increased risk to mental health problems related to depression, anxiety, trauma, um, family stresses and substance use disorders. I just talk about some of the stresses there. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go through, but you can see specifically to police, there are a number of stresses that impact day to day, not only on the work that they do, but also too uh, involving the, uh, the organization and also involving um, the home life. And they tend to accumulate. You can see here in the diagram, it's talking about the bucket of stress where all these elements feed into a bucket. Um, and the bucket can only take so much and eventually that bucket will overflow. And when it overflows, uh, that's when the individual has problem and they can't cope with what's happening um, in the complex uh, situation of all the finances, work relationships and health. Another important point is understanding the elements of trauma that, are associated, that police are exposed to. And we very much are aware of um, the acute trauma, which is usually associated with a, a single event that happens in one life, one's life. Cumulative trauma, uh, adversity, um, uh, which is indexed by a count of lifetime exposure. And that happens quite a lot to police because of the consistent exposure to trauma. Uh, compassion fatigue, another one that isn't talked about much, but is very prevalent with police. And it's a condition characterized by gradual lessening of 
compassion over time. The condition is common uh, amongst workers who work directly with victims uh, and victims of crime and situations. Operational stress injuries, just the persistent psychological difficulty revol resulting from work, the job stress, which we've talked about, and moral injury, which is a relatively uh, new element in that uh, it emphasises the uh, psychological, social and cultural aspects of trauma. Uh, moral, moral injury is normally the human response to a normal traumatic event where police have witnessed or been involved in matters that transgress their deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. Uh, moral injury can also uh, be experienced by police who have been transgressed against in the workplace. The injury may in those cases include the sense of betrayal and anger at the organisation. Those who have seen and experienced death, mayhem, destruction and violence and have had their worldviews shattered uh, often suffer a moral, uh, moral injury. So in terms of what, what can we do, where can we go about the mental health of police? Critically, and we heard some, some discuss this, that organisational support is critical. And what I mean by that is uh, support where the organisation has to invest time and money. And as we heard, budgets are always tight, uh, money's always short, but if we don't invest in our people, we can't achieve the goals that we're expected to achieve by our elected leaders. So it's critically important that we do that. Early intervention, where the assessment and delivery of effective intervention strategies to people at risk or in the early stages of experiencing mental health are critical. Prevention, the next step, and the support to those living with a mental health problem to stay well and prevent people from relapsing or reaching crisis point. And that's where I was in terms of my, my lived experience. Uh, culture of acceptance. Police uh, have a very strong culture and they're very skeptical uh, and trying to eliminate the limiting, the limit, ling lingering stigma surrounding mental health issues is difficult because we're taught to be suspicious, but we're also taught uh, to be that person that is uh, virtually unbreakable, the one that goes into uh, elements of, of, um, of issues where others are running from it. Um, supporting mechanisms, peer support programs are critical to allow officers to come forward and seek that initial contact and get some help when they're not feeling well. Um, access to allied health professionals such as psychologists and social workers. Education, communication is pivotal, as is relationships and partnerships with academia. There's a plethora of research out there that doesn't really uh, get used by police and a lot of the hard work is already done. Um, individual actions. Um, that officers can take. Nutrition is critical um, for the mental health, given the connection between the brain and the stomach. Sleep, we've heard poor sleep hygiene with uh, the way the police have their rosters and their extended hours. Exercise is a, another nexus with the, with the brain and the mental health and, and helps to uh, alleviate some of the issues uh, with me mental health um, exposure. Uh, Substance abuse is critical in um, policing. Uh, use of alcohol, use of non-prescription drugs in a way to deal with the things that are that are bothering police and being able to try and uh, explain about that and, and get police to move away from that because I did that, it wasn't helpful as much as I thought it was. And finally, and probably one of the most important is undertaking social connection and engagement with family and friends. That's critical. That's what keeps police grounded away from the day-to-day -day issues of police work. So finally, I'll just touch on some of the positives and the, and the benefits. Um, we know that our societies are hugely dependent upon the police and their ability to ensure the safety of the community, deal with crime and protect its people. But if police officers have mental injuries, if they're left untreated, it considerably impacts on the ability to perform their duties and is costly to the department and the society. And it also underpins the confidence of the community if uh, police are, are behaving in, uh, in, in different ways than what the, uh, what the community expects. But it's also well known that mental health uh, illness is treatable and yet without treatment, the affected police officer is severely limited in their function. Further and perhaps most importantly, that this potentially places the community at risk. Encouraging mental health practices into policing to show that organisations are serious and committed to ensuring the psychological health and well-being of their people is of paramount importance. In doing so, police departments will encounter greater productivity, lower levels of absenteeism, save on insurance premiums, 
reduce risk factors for disease and illnesses, improves quality of life and sense of well-being, creates a dynamic position for greater staff recruitment and retention, provides better cognitive performance and reduces stress, and encourages and supports stronger employee-employer relationships, and most of all, potentially save lives of officers and help their families. If you're interested in looking further into this type, um, I really encourage you to, um, to uh, look at the Global Law Enforcement and Public Health Association, uh, known as GLEFA. You can get them on the internet at www.gleffa.com and they talk about the synergies um, of public health and policing, but also have a very strong stream on policing health and mental health. So with that, um, I'll finish and thank you, uh, Upasana, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Grant. I think uh, also not only the very uh, interesting presentation, but also sh uh, sharing your own experience uh, in the 32 years of, um, of policing that you had with the Australian uh, Federal Police. Now uh, we will, we have uh, 15